Hello everyone and welcome again to Expert Eye Radiology channel. This is Dr. Tamer Gawish. In this video I'll explain to you how to approach an MRI of the knee and how to write a well-structured report. So first of all, uh, let's jump to the sequences and uh, take a quick review uh, on the sequences we use in MSK imaging. As you all know, uh, proton density with fat suppression and gradient images as well as uh, stir sequences are the mainstay of musculoskeletal imaging. Uh, these are used uh, for the assessment of internal derangements of the joints. So PD, GRE, and STIR sequences are uh, used to assess articular cartilage and fibrocartilage abnormalities, the labrum, the meniscus, and uh, they are fluid sensitive and very beneficial in assessment of the internal derangements. Not only we use uh, the PD and gradient sequences, we also have to include always a T1 and a T2 uh, sequence for most of the joints. Uh, for the knee, uh, in our practice, we always include a sagittal T1 sequence, and this is very sensitive for the anatomical details for assessment of the bone marrow, and T1, of course, is very, very sensitive for the assessment of fractures. In fact, uh, T1 may be more sensitive in the detection of subtle fractures than CT. T2-weighted images are important mainly for the assessment uh, of post-operative studies and we include it routinely in an axial view, which is, uh, as I'll explain later, very important for the assessment of the retropatellar cartilage and the ACL integrity. So this is a brief uh, description of the sequences we use and now let's jump from the sequences uh, to a normal MRI case and I'll explain to you how to approach and how to uh, examine the study in order to write a well, very well uh, structured report. So first off we start with the axial view. This is an axial proton density with fat suppression and this is an axial T2 uh, turbo spin echo image. Uh, we always include the axial T2 and the axial PD fat in all sequences and uh, when you examine the axial scans there are two main things you have to examine. They are the most common sites of pathology, and these are the patella and the patellar um, structures, the retropatellar cartilage and the retinacula. And the most important thing you have to always look at is the proximal ACL attachment. The femoral ACL attachment right here and right here is very, very important to be examined in the axial scans as uh, this is the most sensitive sequence for detection of proximal ACL tears. And proximal ACL tears are the most common site of ACL injuries. So you get an axial scan, you begin to examine it, you take a look at the patella, uh, view the patellar position, the retropatellar cartilage, the medial and lateral retinacula. If you go upward, you will see the distal fibers of the quadriceps muscles and below this level you will have a nice view of the infrapatellar tendon down to its insertion at the tibial tuberosity. So this is the first thing we examine. The second thing and the most important thing and I have to stress on it all the time is the ACL attachment. So the ACL attachment has always to be homogeneous hypo-intense on T2 uh, axial images and you cannot see any fluid signal at this site. So it's in the T2, it's homogeneous hypointense, in the proton fat, it's intermediate signal, but you cannot see any fluid like this fluid, or this is, of course, at the posterior joint recess. You cannot see fluid signal uh, like this within the attachment. Any attenuation or any fluid signal at this site, you should suspect an ACL injury. So what else can you see in the axial scans? If you look on the medial side, you will be able to see the medial collateral ligament from its femoral attachment down to its tibial attachment. On the lateral side, you will be seeing the lateral collateral ligament from the femoral attachment down to the fibular attachment. Uh, also, we have to take a quick look on the muscles. We saw the distal quadriceps muscles uh, at the popliteal fossa. You can always see the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius. Behind the tibia, there is the popliteus muscle, which gives way to the popliteus tendon. This is the popliteus tendon coursing behind the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus 
and inserting in the femur. This is a very important structure and common pitfall. Upper to that level, you can see the distal hamstring muscles, and these are the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and on the medial side, you have three consecutive tendons, which form the pes and serenus, which are the gracilis, sartorius, and semitendinosus tendons. They insert, as you see here, the three tendons are coursing right behind each other and inserting in a common insertion at the medial aspect of the tibial uh, metaphysis. And on the lateral side, you can see the distal fibers of the biceps femoris. And of course, between those, there is the popliteal fossa and the popliteal uh, vessels. And behind them, there is the sciatic nerve. So between the insertion of the semimembranosus and the medial head of the gastrocnemius, this is the site where you get the Baker cyst. Uh, so any Baker cyst, any popliteal cyst, will arise between these two tendons and project from the joint space posteriorly at this level. So what else can you see at the axial views? You can, of course, uh, examine if there is any effusion. Uh, within the effusion, you can see any loose bodies. There is synovitis, uh, Baker cyst, as we said. And, uh, of course, you are examining the bones, so you can have a nice view of any marrow abnormalities, and this is, of course, just normal red marrow reconversion. Okay, so this is uh, how we examine the axial views. After that, we jump to the sagittal views and the coronal views. And uh, I, al I, I always like to examine the sagittal hand in hand with the coronal. So in the sagittal and coronal views, you begin to examine uh, with the things that you didn't see in the axil. And this is, of course, beginning with the menisci, the lateral meniscus, and the medial meniscus. And when you examine the menisci, uh, I have to highlight uh, small points. There are uh, rules that you cannot forget. First of all, the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is always larger than the anterior horn. And the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, as well as both horns of the lateral meniscus, have to be triangular, have to have pinpoint apex, and you cannot have any missing part and or any blunting within the meniscal form. So the, in the sagittal views, you have the horns appearing as triangles. And the body, if you go more sagittal, the body will be rectangular in shape. This is the lateral and this is the medial. On the opposite side, at the coronal views, you have both meniscal bodies appearing as triangles, while the horns, the posterior horns, and the anterior horns appear as rectangular in shape. And uh, another rule you have to always put in mind is the meniscal root. You have always to see the meniscal root passing beyond a line uh, drawn parallel to the condyle. So, if you draw a line here at the medial femoral condyle, the meniscal root will always have to pass this line. And on the lateral side as well, the meniscal root will always have to pass this line. So if you don't see the meniscal root passing this line, you have to think of a meniscal root tear. And that's a very, very common pathology, especially in the setting of um, osteoarthritis. So what else can you see in the sagittal views? Of course, we saw the attachment of the ACL in the axial, and we can here see the ACL coursing from the femoral attachment down to the tibial attachment. So the ACL, and a very important thing you have to know is the ACL is not a homogeneous structure. It's formed of two bundles, and the two bundles are not homogeneous in shape or signal. So it's commonly you can see it uh, homogeneous hypointense at the PCL, but oftentimes, you can see the PCL heterogeneous in signal. You have an anterior bundle that's homogeneous and the posterior bundle that appears heterogeneous. And you don't call this a pathology. This is not a sprain. This is not a tear. This is just a normal ACL. And this is a normal ap accepted appearance of the ACL. You can verify this at the axial T2. If you do an ag uh, a sagittal T2, you will see the ACL homogeneous hypointense in this. but if you examine a proton density or examine a gradient sequence, you will see it slightly heterogeneous. You can have the two bundles separable. You can have some sort of striations, but this is the normal ACL. And in the coronal scans, you can see it, of course, 
from the femoral attachment and you can trace it down to the attachment, the tibial attachment at the tibial spines area. On contrary, the PCL is always homogeneous and hypointense in all sequences. So you cannot accept uh, striations along the long axis of the uh, ligament like in the ACL. So the PCL has always to be homogeneous, hypointense, and this is uh, this homogeneity will be seen in the axial scans, in the coronal scans, and in the sagittal scans. Uh, Next, we jump to the collateral ligaments. This is the medial collateral ligament. And on the other side, this is the lateral collateral ligament. So MCL and LCL are the next thing uh, on our agenda. After that, on the, uh, on the sagittal view, you have always to take a nice look at the Hoffa's fat pad or in the infrapatellar fat pad. And it has to always be homogeneous, hypointense on fat suppression. And if you take a sagittal T1, you will see the fat pad is nicely hyperintense with the fibrovascular striations, uh, the stroma within the fat pad. This is not the only fat pad within the knee, and you have to always look at this one too. This is the suprapatellar fat pad, and it is a homogeneous uh, fat signal, and this is a very common site of knee pain and a common site of impingement. So if you see edema at the PD fat in the sagittal view, and you confirm it in the other views, this may be suprapatellar fat pad impingement and this is a very very common missed uh, site for pathology. So what else uh, do we examine in the um, PD fat coronal and sagittal? You have to take a very careful examination of the articular cartilage and as you can see of course the PD fat is a very sensitive sequence for the articular cartilage. You can see it in the sagittal and you can see it in the coronal at the medial compartment and at the lateral compartment, the articular cartilage has to be homogeneous in signal, homogeneous in girth. You cannot see any defects, and defects, of course, will be uh, fluid-filled. And there is a difference between the intermediate gray signal of the cartilage and any fluid signal. So I, I think you can now uh, appreciate the difference in signal between the articular cartilage and this is a minimal traces of joint fluid, and you can see the difference in signal. So any cartilage ulcer or fissure or chondropathy, you will, feel, uh, you will see the defect filled with the joint fluid, and it's very easily appreciated in the axial and sagittal scans. So uh, what else uh, do we have to look to, uh, at at the um, coronal and sagittal? You have to look at the posterolateral corner of the knee, and this is the area between the um, lateral aspect of the tibial plateau, the fibular head, and the LCL and the biceps tendon attachment. And this area uh, contains the popliteus tendon. We showed it in the axial scans. And this is the tendon coursing behind the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. It passes within a hiatus, within a small hole uh, at the meniscofemoral attachment. Uh, sorry, at the meniscocapsular attachment and inserts at the uh, lateral femoral condyle. So the popliteus tendon is the one of the major components of the posterolateral corner. And you can have, um, according to the scans and according to the uh, thickness, you can see the arcuate ligament. And there is another small ligament uh, connecting the fibular head with the popliteus tendon. This is the popliteofibular ligament. And these structures are always torn in the setting of ACL injury. These are the indirect signs of ACL injury. So if you have a torn ACL, you will see bone bruises at the lateral femoral condyle, at the lateral uh, tibial plateau, and you will commonly see tearing at the posterolateral corner, whether it involves the lateral collateral ligament, it involves the arcuate ligament or the popliteofibular ligament. All these structures may be torn in the setting of an ACL injury. So, uh, that's not it. You also have to look at the patella. You have to examine uh, the patellar um, uh, appearance and the uh, height of the patella. Is it a patella alta? Is it a patella baja? And of course, uh, there are indices to be calculated, the Deschamps index and other indices uh, you'll find in the textbooks and papers on um, examining the patellar maltracking, and that's from the lateral subluxation patella alta, patella baja, transient dislocation, and these are all called patellar maltracking. You have to take uh, 
careful uh, uh, notice of any of these pathology. So let's review what we said. Uh, we start with the axial. In the axial, we said the uh, patella and the patellar um, fixing uh, structures, as well as the ACL, are the most two important things to examine in the axial view. Uh, you also have to examine the muscles and the tendons, the retropatellar cartilage, the effusion, and any marrow abnormality. On the sagittal and coronal, as we said, you examine the menisci, the cruciates, the collateral ligaments, and the articular cartilage. Don't forget to take a look at the fat pads. Don't forget to uh, take a look at the posteromedial and posterolateral corners of the knee and examine the patellar uh, location. So, uh, of course, this is not all the sequences we do. We do additional two sequences. We do a sagittal T1 and we do a sagittal gradient. So T1, uh, as we said, is sensitive for detecting marrow abnormalities and detecting fractures. And uh, you can verify uh, chondral or meniscal uh, tears or injuries at the T1 as well. We also do a volumetric gradient sequence. And this is, of course, not obligatory. It's up to you. Uh, the technique of the knee MRI is not standard worldwide. Uh, according to the preference of uh, the examining uh, doctor, according to the suspicion uh, provided by the orthopedist uh, or the orthopedic uh, surgeon, you can either have a standard examination or you can add additional sequences. We do this gradient volumetric sequence uh, mainly for examining the menisci and uh, cartilage abnormalities. And you can see here, you can see very nicely the articular cartilage. So if there is any abnormality, you can verify or you have another additional sequence to verify um, the cartilage uh, abnormality. So uh, that's how you examine an MRI of the knee. And let me now show you uh, how to do uh, a well-structured report. So once you take a look at the axial and follow this by the sagittal and coronal scans, you have to put the findings you um, uh, you found in the uh, examination into a well-structured report. So you have always to know uh, the items within the report and make some sort of a checklist in your mind or even have a printed report or have the soft copy in front of you on the screen to make sure you're not forgetting anything. So in the report, uh, as you now see on your screen, we start with the menisci, the medial and lateral meniscus, and we follow this by the ligaments. Uh, we comment on the ACL, the PCL, the collateral ligaments, and the posterolateral corner structures. Uh, next, you comment on the uh, extensor mechanism and the patella and the muscles and tendons. Following that, you comment on any joint fluid, Baker cyst, joint fluid, synovitis, any other fluid field structure you find. And uh, after that, of course, you have to detail uh, any cartilage abnormality seen at the retropatellar compartment, the medial uh, or lateral femorotibial compartment, and make sure you're not forgetting anything uh, in the detail. So that's it, guys. Uh, this is how you approach an MRI of the knee. Uh, these are the sequences we do, and this is, uh, this is the way we examine the sequences. You have always to have a checklist in your mind and make sure you're not forgetting anything. So in the next video, I'll uh, present to you, I'll, I'll show you a, a small PowerPoint presentation detailing some of the very common pitfalls. And after that, we'll uh, take a brief discussion of the meniscal uh, injuries and meniscal tear types, because this is some sort of a debate. Although it's standardized now in the orthopedic society, in the radiological society, uh, the terminology is not uh, crystal clear in uh, everybody's mind. So I'll, uh, in the next video, I'll explain to you how to um, examine the meniscal tears, the meniscal tear types, and uh, the standard terminology that the orthopedist surgeons expect from us when we write the report. So stay tuned and see you in the next video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and uh, thank you very much.